Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to Smart Muslim Podcast. I am your host, Farhat Amin, and I wanted to talk about how do you get a healthy work life balance? I think all of us grapple with this, men and women, old and young. And what I'm going to just speak is about how I have, I think, now got that balance. It's taken me a long time. I just want to share my wisdom dare I say that and experience Uh, so but what's made me even think about this because I don't talk about work I don't even like talking about when I was a high school teacher but I've been listening to this amazing podcast it's serial podcast and it's the latest season which is called the Trojan Horse Affair you really need to listen to it because it has blown my mind and it's opened up memories about working as a teacher in the UK education system that I had filed away into a box and closed that box and put it in a cupboard and I never wanted to think about it but I I just and so in a way am I using this podcast episode as therapy maybe I am but I do think there are some lessons I learned along the way that if you can gain anything from it then I'll be happy if I can share that wisdom with you. And the other reason is that through the coaching and, you know, the the coaching I do for single sisters who are looking to get married, this is something that I keep seeing coming up. And it really made me think, wow, I wasn't alone in trying to, how do I prioritize work and don't let it take over my life, but stay true as to, to my Islamic principles? What does Islam even say about work? Because, you know, we're living in a capitalist, uh, in a society, in a secular, liberal society, most of us. That's the dominant um, ideology nowadays. And the economic system is capitalism. And it just pushes us to work, to want to make money, that if we do that, if we make enough money, we will be happy. And so you just work and work. And when you're a woman staying at home, you think, I should be working. Why am I not working? Why am I not making money? Everyone's making money. Everyone's got a side hustle. You know, even whether it's Muslim, non-Muslim, it's like that is what is being pushed. And, you know, it affects us. It does. Okay, so I became a, I was a, alhamdulillah, I got married. I had my kids and there was an age where they got to, where I started to think about, it was a friend of mine, she was doing, told me that you could do part-time degrees at the local university. So I thought, yeah, my children are now, they're in education, I, I have time. So, and it was um, free back then, I was one of the lucky ones. And I thought, why not? Let's do it. I can, I spoke to my husband, he said, yeah, go for it, you've got time, if you, you know, just, and I, I was very clear, I didn't want to I was clear about my role as a wife and a mum and I was proud and loved it and it was just now I had the time and I thought yeah I'm going to do this. So I did that and that was fine and I did have the support and help of my mum, my beloved mum, she would take care of the kids sometimes, my sister-in-laws were very good as well, our children would play together and also my husband used to help me with my checking my assignments, it all worked very well. So You know, and I took it slowly, nothing stressful, although it was hard work. Don't think it wasn't. Don't want to make it sound it was too easy. Um, And then I finished and thought, okay, I'm going to now apply for PGCE because that was the goal. I thought teaching is the only profession I will go into because I love education. Um, And I thought the holidays will fit in with my children. I'm not going to, I don't want to be, I want to be there when they're on holiday. And I thought, you can work part-time as a teacher as well. So that I did that, that was much harder because it wasn't um, part-time, it was full-time. But again, with the support of my family, I managed it. And once I finished, then I started to apply for jobs. The first jo- and, and well, the first job was uh, where I had a placement. And I didn't get that job. And I know why I didn't get that job is because... I I was a I was a hijabi I was Muslim this is in East London and the school was very white I don't think they wanted another brown face in the department they had one so they ticked the um, ethnicity box 
Also, whilst we were, there were four of us hijabi Muslim um, student teachers who had a placement. And there was one of our friends. She was very sweet and she was, she didn't know she should not have spoken about Islam to any students. So she was speaking to one student in her class who showed an interest in Islam. And then she gave her a tape. It was just a talk. And that's all she did. It, it was My memory is slightly fuzzy, actually. It was either a tape or a piece of literature. And then basically the school, they straight away, they came down on a really hard they suspect they kicked her out of the school and they reported her to the university she was study we were studying at and they said we are terminating your your placement and then they called us in the other the other student teachers and told us what had happened now i was intelligent enough i kept a total poker face i didn't didn't show any reaction my friend on the other side had returned straight to me and looked at me horrified and I could, I, and I just kept looking at the man, the person who was in charge of us, and I didn't show him any emotion, because I knew it was disgusting what they did. They they were really heavy-handed. So I knew this school was Islamophobic, even though they acted like they were really multicultural, and all the rest of it. But what I realised straight away was, as a Muslim teacher, you have to, you have to like, uh, you have to hide your Islam. You cannot really say what you think about anything. And you cannot talk about Islam. So this sister tried to give some dawah and she was penalised. But what all, they also told her, she was really upset and sad. You know, this is your, your time, your energy. You know, she's a young woman. But alhamdulillah, the in university was fine. They said, this is completely wrong. And they got her a placement somewhere else. And alhamdulillah, look at Allah's wisdom. She got a place in a Catholic school, a Christian school, that gave her a place to pray They were super accommodating about her being Muslim. So then that also taught me that, you know, some schools and administrations are racist, Islamophobic. They give it all the talk about being liberal and progressive, but deep down they're not. They're hypocrites. And that's something you learn in the workplace. But then you can find other schools. I'm focusing on schools because I'm a teacher. But even places of work, you can find places that will accommodate you being a Muslim. And one of so number one, don't stay in an environment that makes you feel inferior about Islam, that makes you want to hide your Islam, that makes you apologize for wanting to pray. But okay, so that was the first. So I didn't get that first job. And at the time I was really upset. I kept thinking this is so near home, it would have been so good. But Alhamdulillah, Allah had better plans for me. And so that's number two. You have to have rely on Allah. Like I did the interview, I did the teaching, it was all good, but Allah had a better plan for me, you know, and I can't see in the future, Allah can. So remember that, when you don't get a job, don't worry about it, think Alhamdulillah, it's khair in this. I don't know it, I can't see it, but I'm I'm limited, I'm just a human being, but Allah, Allah's got my back, Allah knows what's good for me. So then, okay, so this is, we were living in London. My husband then gets a job in London. He was a teacher as well, so that was cool. And then we decided to, we thought, let's look outside of London. So we moved out of London and I applied to jobs. Um, and I'm going to tell you where you live, where I live, because I don't think you're going to stalk me. <laughs> and I don't think it really matters. So I live in Luton. I then applied to jobs in Luton because there were a, there's a shortage of te- English teachers there. And I had relatives who lived in Luton, so I thought... Let me try there. There were loads of jobs in Luton. That should have given me, that should have set alarm bells. That why are there so many vacancies in Luton? But, you know, I didn't know. So I apply for a job and I get it in, but okay, no, I've missed out a big chunk here. Let me rewind. So when I went for the interview, I went in. Now, I've always lived in East London, very multicultural, lots of Asians, lots of Muslims been very com- not felt too much racism when I was living in my area. Of course it existed and I did have incidents, but overall I hadn't experienced, and Islamophobia I hadn't experienced too much. And the things you have to remember, I was totally new to work in this school. Even the colleges I worked in, I worked as EAL teacher. Again, okay, you know, EAL, they're all um, brown, were foreigners, alhamdulillah, immigrants. You know, it was excellent. So, okay, I go to school and I should have noticed, and I didn't, 
I must have my blinkers on, that this school is very white. And I'm going in there to teach English in my Himal and Jilbab. I was even, even in the, in the staff room, it was all white and I didn't notice it. <laughs> so maybe because the previous school I'd worked in was all white. I, I didn't feel intimidated by white people. So I, it, I didn't think it was going to be a problem. So I go there. I, what I should have noticed, there was a brown, a Pakistani woman there and she kept staring at me. She was staring at me so much. And I now I know why she was staring at me. And I'll tell you why later. I then got to know her later. So I do the interview and even the kids were majority white, some black kids. But you know, when they do the interviews for a teacher, they give you a good class. So beware. And the thing went, the interview went well. Even the the teaching thing went well. The guy who interviewed me, the head of English, again, I should have picked up. But then this is because I was new. He was strange. He, He was strange. And I should have realized this guy is strange and I'll talk about the weirdness of this man later he was a complete weirdo my head of department but he was very nice as well very polite made an effort to say my name properly right cut a long story short I get the job then when I first walked in the first day and then I saw all the whole school with all the kids I then hit me like a truck that oh my god where am i i am in a school full of white students and i am a brown hijabi where what the hell am i doing here (laughs) and then basically the problems began from there day one i could tell there were students who they didn't know me but they hated me but they were intelligent enough to never say anything blatantly racist or islamophobic because they would get the school's policy was that wasn't allowed but okay, that was one thing. The kids, that was fine. I could deal with them. That was, no, that was a certain level of shift. Then you had some brown students and Muslims. There was one hijabi student who, you, basically, this is, the, this is what happens to some Muslim kids. They, either they had been, experienced racism or they, they were self-hating Muslim, I call them. You get self-hating Muslims who, for whatever reason, they don't want to be Muslim, like they don't, well, it's upbringing they hate islam they hate being muslim you know it's what the family has done or the way they've been uh the, again the the racism and islamophobia that they have had so when they see another muslim visibly muslim, they then take that hate out on them or they want to show the other white students oh i'm not like her she's not one of me i'm going to make her life hell and the silly girl oh, i'll guide her she caused me trouble but i, I and i caused her trouble back i i put her straight but even her father was a total nut job uh, seriously this is get ready for nut jobs in teaching parents kids and teachers so just it's like a preparation be prepared and you're going to find this in work you have to just le- learn to deal with the nut cases and don't let them get to you pray to Allah that's what you have to do when you, you come up with these crazies uh, don't let them spoil your life and go home and think about them just and this is the other thing, point three, do your protection du'as. I didn't used to do my protection du'as. I now always do my protection du'as. Read your quls, read your ayatul kursi, read your yasin. These are the things that will help you deal with work problems. You know, there's some things you can do, and I'll tell you, you know, and I, and I used to do them, like the from your level, but without the protection of, you never know what people are jealous of you. People just are, oh, they hate your Muslimness, and you can't do anything about it. You can only seek protection in Allah from crazy people at work. And these crazy people will be Muslim sometimes. As I've learned from that podcast, it reminded me, you get total t- twisted Muslims, seriously. And then don't, so don't be shocked when you meet them and when they backbite about you and when they stab you in the back. Yeah, just, just I'm telling you, be ready for them, sisters. <laughs> As I just said those words, backstabbing Muslims, I had the biggest flashback about an incident that really did change the course of my life, my teaching and my career and my work. And I'll tell you more about that straight after this short break. Did you know that I have had 71,000 listens to Smart Muslim podcast? I know, it's crazy, isn't it? I looked at the stats today. But here's another shocking figure. I've only got 18 
reviews on Apple Podcasts. Now, I don't know why that is. Maybe you could help me out. But I'll tell you what, I really need you to give me some more reviews. This is a blatant request for reviews. I don't make any money from the reviews, but what it will do, I'm thinking if you're listening to the podcast, you must be enjoying it. If you have listened to more than one podcast, then I'm going to count you as a fan. So therefore, you need to ask yourself, why haven't you left a review? And guess how long it takes to do a review? One minute. Just go to Apple Podcasts, and I'm going to be honest, that's where I want the reviews. Just give it five stars and just just write me one word and then like one sentence. That is all I'm asking for. And I know this ad sounds desperate, and I, but I just thought, I'm going to try. What's the harm? You're Muslim. I'm Muslim. You'll be helping me out. You'll be letting other sisters find out about the podcast. And I'm going to say something else. There are some pretty rubbish podcasts out there. I've tried to listen to some and I look at their reviews and they have got hundreds. They're talking about the most shameless garbage and they have hundreds of reviews. And I just think, why is my humble little Islamic podcast that I'm trying to do some good, why do I only have 18 reviews? And I'm going to tell you something else. I get reviews from brothers um, brothers who they they've I've got to you know they've been on Clubhouse rooms with me. These brothers they leave reviews on Amazon for my books. They leave leave reviews on Apple Podcasts, and I just think Alhamdulillah, you know, if they can do that for me, why can't my sisters do it as well? So yep, I'm trying to emotionally blackmail you t- into giving me a review. Now, okay, if you hate this podcast, do not leave a review. I'm going to also say that. I have got one hate-filled one, which accused me of being misogynistic, but I'm going to ignore that. Well, you can see I haven't ignored it. It's affected me. But if you could just please, if you want to do me one favor, leave a review on Apple Podcasts today. Jazakallah khair. So what is this traumatic, life-changing incident? And actually, it's two. I just remembered that I have hidden away so deeply in my psyche that I just don't talk about it. Um, Well, it, the reason why I didn't, haven't spoken about what I'm now going to speak about is because it involved Muslims. And the incident just shocked me so much. And it changed the course of my work. It actually changed the course of my life. I can really say that. So do you remember I said to you, I was homeschooling my kids and then I went to university. Why was I homeschooling my kids? That's the question. Um, Me and my husband decided that we didn't want to, we'd gone through state school and it done an okay job for us. But the options we had back then, we weren't really happy with that. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to homeschool, we're going to homeschool. I I can do it, inshallah. And then what happened was, we actually found an Islamic school. Yeah, that was it, where we were living. And it was good. And my young, my eldest son, my first son, he went there. It was good. We were happy. But then we moved. But when we moved to a new area, there were some sisters who, they approached me and said, we're going to open up a school. It's, it's um, someone has offered, they've got a, a building that we can use. And would you like to be involved? Um, and so we thought, wow, that sounds good. It's just going to be small, be nice, other kids. And so, so um, the, the building belonged to, to a brother and then me and another sister, um, we set it up and we put a lot of uh, time and energy. It, it was really hard work, but because we thought we're doing it for our children and it's, it, we're doing it for, you know, there were other parents who they couldn't teach, but we thought, yeah, this is something good. It was totally, our intentions were so pure. Um, you know, we were paid, it, not a lot, it was, but you know, there was, it was a really good system going on. And then the other sister got pregnant, mashallah. And then, um, Alhamdulillah, I got pregnant as well. So j- picture this, two pregnant Muslim women who have set, set up a, like a homeschooling group. That's what we were working for minimum wage. Um, and then 
And the thing is, we were just so busy and we were happy and the children were happy and they were learning. They're learning Quran, they're learning Arabic. It was, I, I was so happy to be part of this. And then what happened was um, someone else approached us. It was getting too, the building was too small. And they said, why don't we turn this into a bigger project and let's get a bigger building and like, let's take a few more students and, and maybe we can register. This was when it was, you know, you could do it this way. Let's register as Islamic school. And we thought, yeah, wow, this is really good. Alhamdulillah, there's barakah in this. And now, so so that's what we were doing. And our, like, like I said, our intentions were very pure. And remember, I'm pregnant with my third child now. And so there was, but the sheer joy of this what was, was what kept us going. And the look on the children's faces and the Islamic atmosphere, alhamdulillah, it was really nice. Okay, you're going to think I'm going on a really weird, weird tangent now, but I'm now going to quote some Shakespeare because I'm an English high school teacher, remember. I'm going to quote a quote King Duncan from Macbeth. And in this scene, he's describing, there was a lord who he gave, well, he gave him a title, he gave him land. And then that that um, lord, um, he, he committed regicide, no, no, not regicide. He went behind his back and he betrayed him and went with the king, one of the North, I think it was the king of Netherlands, to try to take over Scotland. And then the Duncan sends Macbeth, who is his warrior and Banquo, to fight and defeat him. And then he is killed. And so Duncan, when reflecting upon his behaviour, that Lord's behaviour, he says, there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. He was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. I'm going to come back in, in, in a minute to explain why that quote. But please remember that quote. There's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. So he's saying, how people act in front of you, what face they show you, you have no idea what's going on in their heart or in their mind. So we moved to this better premises. Some more kids came on. And it was really good. We Another, you know, I said the one sister got pregnant, mashallah. So another sister got involved um, and she was helping with the administration. Now, what I was unaware of was that parents were unhappy. They didn't tell, t- come and speak to me about whatever they were unhappy with. They, they, so they, they were just talking, they were unhappy. And then I went on leave I have, Alhamdulillah, I had my youngest son. And then one day, with my child in my in the car seat, I went to the school to see how everything was going. And when I got there, two parents, two men, two brothers, who people who were Islamic, yeah, because this is like an Islamic school, are handing out a letter to parents. And this is, the, this is where the Trojan horse letter, you know, kind of like gave me... Um, flashbacks and they're handing but but they but it wasn't anonymous they had proudly signed this letter and they're handing it to parents and then they didn't give me a copy but they gave the copy to the other sister and she gave it to me and she said look at what they have written and what they had written was that we were basically just after the money we were doing they questioned our motives it was that somehow we, this was a money-making scheme that we had taken this school and changed it. It was it was the most heartbreaking letter I ever read, and I can that's why I can understand what what the when Tahir Alam talks about the letter and the lies that were written about him. It, I was thinking, why am I feeling this pain? And and it, it was because I'd gone through a very similar thing, and I started to cry because. Everything I had done was being twisted by Islamic people who I thought were Islamic and were my brothers and who, to my face, were all very sister, sister. And, and, this, and this, is, this was a game changer for me in the way I viewed, I stopped being naive and so trusting. I didn't just take people, like Duncan said, you know, face value, that, um, you know, you can talk the talk. But uh, so that that was... That's, so what then happened was um, 
subsequently we had some some arbitration with a, a, a Muslim elder and what happened was that the brother we said we'll agree to whatever is decided the school was given to these men who knew nothing about education and we were then told you have nothing you, this is nothing to do with you anymore said you can keep your children in there because uh, sure as hell I wasn't going to do that um, I wasn't going to sacrifice my children's education and so I me and the other sister whose son was at the school we were then left where our chill our children they could no longer be with their friends who and this is the thing that really got to me was how children the children were the ones who suffered but the backbiting and slander that was done to us and also what did that look like to all the parents in the parents who were not involved in any of this they thought what the hell is this practicing muslims fighting and spreading lies about others distributing letters it was you can see that they had not thought through their behavior at all um but yes yeah, so so this that that school um they then and what did they do they get another sister someone who's my very close friend to come on as a head teacher alhamdulillah she was had such a big heart i don't have anything gets so her she she was that kind of person who would who could see that something had to be done they had they were clueless but for me and the other sister we were then homeschooling our children and then i um and then other some other parents contacted me and said that we don't want our kids going there anymore can we please come can you set some could we be part of your homeschooling group again um so can you see it was just so um so alhamdulillah i was then started homeschool a small group of children my um but the um yeah so so what did that teach me it 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 made me not trust muslims uh, and i had thought i was going to be go and work in muslim schools and i had thought now this is the thing the other thing it taught me was i had no contract we had written zero down and that's what i realized allah tells us to write things down we had just gone on this you know assumption of oh, muslims you can trust them but allah says write things down in the quran it says write contracts down everything should have been clear and so what that did teach me is i'm i'm not going to go into any kind of work i'm where it doesn't have contract and it also made me think i'm never touching a muslim school or getting involved in any kind of you know muslim islam education with a barge pole i'm not going near them and it's going to be if i'm going to do something i'm going to do it on my own and can you see that's so not the way we should be thinking we we think of community we think of trust and what was good i'd had a few problematic one one problematic parent when i was doing my homeschool thing i kicked that parent out so fast they they didn't know what hit them because i thought yeah i'm in control now no one is going to spoil what i set up so so can you see even though it was a very traumatic experience um i did learn lessons from it and i think alhamdulillah allah i was meant to learn those lessons but it was like i said it was very painful and um and i then didn't want to be and, and the thing is that i didn't want to see those people i didn't want to see those parents um and i wouldn't see them uh, and that's good that was good for my mental health um but then god would you believe it a year goes by maybe more than a year go by years go by and then when i said to my close friend who became the who ran that school she then approached me and she said yeah that's my phone she said i've now some other parents new parents have joined the school and they are now looking to get a big building and they want to re- they want to make a, a proper islamic school she said they're nothing to do with those old people but they want to take this small school and make it proper and then i said to uh thank you but no thank you i'm like i said i was so burnt by my experience but she said look why don't you just meet them and i was like i don't want to do this i cannot go through this again i've just got my uh i'm just going to continue my children i just need to focus on my children i don't want any headache but then she persuaded me because then i thought so i'd thinking oh it would be nice for my children to socialize more and maybe you know 
this homeschooling thing I'm doing, it's gone as far as I can. Can you see how I, I was? And so I met them and they were, comp- and I, and they were business minded. They were educated. They took us to see the, they had a site. It was being built for them. Uh, there was a, it was a Muslim landlord and he had given them the land and they were, and um, and it, and I thought, wow. And I was, it was really impressed by the building. And I thought, gosh, this looks really good. And these people, you know, they, they know what they're doing and what they wanted. They wanted me to be involved and I would be in charge of the younger years. And, and remember, by the way, I'm doing my degree part time here and I've got little children. So I had a lot on my plate and I was thinking if I could like move my homeschooling thing, like have other people in charge of it, it would lessen my burden. So, you know, back then, I think I was a bit mental. Well, I took too much on um, and now I look back and think, what was I thinking? But remember, we're talking about work-life balance. So I was trying to reduce my work to get some balance. <laughs> so one of the points here is don't take so much on board, even if you, you can handle it. You look back later and, and you think, I, I do think I, over, I, I overdid it. So to so what happened was I joined this Islamic school. I did it again. And you must be thinking, am I do I like torturing myself? But it was um so what happened then was temporarily we had to go into a building and um the because that other building was taking longer and the registration for the school, they started doing that and I thought that's good. And the administration, which they were they were good. They, um, and I did get a contract this time. I thought I'm not stepping foot in any building, any organization. And I had a contract and it was all good. And you know what? That year where my friend was the head teacher, I don't regret at all. I was like a deputy head because I was there part time. I don't regret that year at all because my children, I think they had the best education because the teachers were brilliant the care, the love, the Islamic atmosphere, it was really good. Even my little one, who was then three, he went to the nursery, he loved it. Muhammad loved that, he loved his teacher, the teachers loved him. Well, the teachers loved all the kids. It was beautiful. So I don't regret, but, and unfortunately there is a but. The Muslim landlord who was making that building for them, he built the building and guess what he did? He then sold it to someone else for a high price so he totally um he, he betrayed them completely he he'd promised he would give the building and he didn't so i felt really sorry for them that um that that so that was the first thing that happened and then surprise surprise um the administ- the people in charge of the school um and it was um, on the governing body, it was a husband, a wife, and there was one brother, they, one blood brother, their brother. And then there was some, now was I on it? I think I was on it. And may, um, oh, and then there was one guy, you know that the letter, one of the letter writers was on that board, but he'd kind of, I'd kind of forgiven him because I didn't have to have anything to do with him. But okay, so they're on there. And then again, Basically, they decided they wanted to sack the head teacher, my friend. That I, I know that was a fact because they didn't want to sack me, but they didn't like that she was very opinionated and had views. And the way they went about it, and the thing is, again, can you see why I haven't spoken about this? Because Muslims don't come across very well, and Muslim schools aren't coming across very well in this. And these are all practicing Islamic people. And there's this idea you want to cover up the faults of your brother or sister. You don't want to criticize. You don't want Muslim schools get a lot of flack um, already. And so you think, you know what? Most of them are good. They're doing a good job. And people don't publicly, Muslims won't publicly criticize them for that reason. That's in the UK anyway. But um so th- but I the thing is I'm not naming any names and and I'm as you're gonna find out, things work out. So yeah, so what they did was they said to all the teachers that we are going to do a um what was it? Everyone needs to apply for the jobs again. And they kind and they basically they kind of guaranteed that don't worry, you're gonna get your jobs. It's just a formality. We either I don't know, it's a law or something. And, we, and then what happened was they did that and then they didn't give her the job. 
And that was how they sacked her. But they gave me my job. And she was devastated because she had, do you remember, she took over that school when they needed her. This is before they came on. And then she moved. So she had put so much time in it. She'd written policies. You don't know how much work she did. Ella knows how much work she did. And and I thought, and then once she had, there was no redress. She couldn't get her job back. So she just had to leave. That's it. She had to pack her bags and leave. And then I was left and I was thinking, I need to leave as well. I can't do this. I can't stay here. But then I thought, my kids are here and I have no idea what is going to happen with this school. So the new term started and surprise, surprise, there were problems. And I just thought, I need to get my kids out of here because this school is going downhill. And I had to, and then look, the, I always wanted my kids, me and my husband wanted our kids to go to Islamic school. We then found a local um, the lo- um, a school, state school, where my their cousins were going to, and they had said the parents, my brothers, and that they said, this is a good school, send them here, and they got places. So, again, there was heartbreak for us that we're taking our kids out of this school and we're now putting them in state school. Can you like you know these changes are not good for children, but um, and then and and that was it. So, and again. I just think, well, Alhamdulillah, for my friend, it was actually a blessing because she then went on to work in a state school and she's got a really good position. Her pay is so much better. Her life changed. It was good she she didn't get that job. Allah knew what's best for her, gave her a new path. And then for me, when I look back at it, I thought if I hadn't, if that had not happened, I probably would still be at that school and I would be putting my blood, sweat and tears not getting paid enough. I would never, I wouldn't be doing this podcast. I wouldn't have moved town. So many things wouldn't have happened if they hadn't done that. So in reality, they did me a favor. Um, but it took me a long time to get over that because can you see it's the second time um, that happened. But then, and I know I said it before, but then I thought, never ever, Muslim schools, I'm not going near them. And uh, because I, because I thought, and this is what, uh, that if, you're, if I wake, work in a state school, they can't do that. They can't just sack you without a reason. You know, there's laws. You can have tribunals. You can be part of a union. So that's why I then decided to do the PGCE because I thought I'm never going to work in a Muslim school, so I better get qualified and work in a state school. Right, so that was the time. So... Um, it's just to show, you know, work, whether you work in, for Muslims or you work for non-Muslims, you are going to get problems. And, you know, Muslim schools, they always expect more from the teachers. And there's literally an army of women who hold up and run these schools and do volunteering. They do the bake sales, they do the charity work. They they do over and above. And I, I do think many of them are exploited. I, I really do. They're not paid enough, but you know what keeps them going? They say, I'm doing this for Allah. So Alhamdulillah, if they're doing this for Allah, Allah will reward them. But it doesn't make the exploitation and the extra work that is loaded on them and the emotional Islamic blackmail that is done to them. Um, I'm going to tell you something. I once cleaned poo off the floor in the toilet at that school because um, they didn't hire cleaners. But I did that because the children wanted to go toilet and one child had then pooed themselves and no one would clean it up. So I said, I'll just go and clean it up. Like, can you see, that's the kind of thing Muslim female teachers will do. A male teacher, I don't think he would do that. Or even a male worker there. But okay, enough about Muslim schools. Back to Luton. Um, So I'm in this uh, all-white school in Luton. Uh, My head teacher, not my head teacher... My head of year turns out to be a complete pervert and a pervert who puts his hands on pretty young white girls in front of other teachers. He put used to put his hands on their knees. He would stroke their hair. And it was always a particular, like, they'd all be, like, pretty young girls. And I started noticing this. And I was thinking, why does no... every? I, I realised everyone knows this. Everyone. Because I, I, it's not just me that's noticing it. and And kids would say things... And even teachers would say things. But I thought, why is no one reporting him? Um, so that's something I noticed. He was, a, and he would hire pretty 
teachers who would, it was literally like his harem. And I didn't get it why I had been employed because I wasn't showing him anything. Um, and I think, again, it was, a, they were desperate, as in, not that I was a bad teacher, but they just needed to, they had no teachers. They had to get teachers. But that guy made my life hell. Like, and because I, I yeah, because I wasn't a bimbo, and I wouldn't, you know, the others would like show him their cleavage and there was nothing, to, no cleavage to see on me. And, but the funny thing is any other teacher, he, he hated certain teachers, not only me. And he would, he would backbite about them. He would make their life misery. He would undermine us all. But funny thing was that none of us were talking to each other and telling each other that this is what he was doing. And but it came out in the end that that's what he did. But the school wouldn't sack him because he was a really good teacher and he got results. I think he just didn't have life and teaching was everything. But um, I had to, after a year, I passed and I decided um, I'm going to leave. Because I thought, I, the reason I stayed for a year was because, you know, if you do teaching, you have to do one year of, um, like, it's like a one year post uh, university until you then you're actually qualified and he was the one who would sign off of it this is the thing he he had power you know in teaching you get these individuals who they get a little bit of power and control and it goes to their head their egos are massive and they're just like Hitler's and they run some to hit teachers similar to the ones mentioned in the Trojan horse affair they just they they want everything done their way and after a year I thought I'm going to get my year and then I'm just leaving but prior to doing that like the thing that um, I did then, he, there was one day he was really rude to me and then I burst out tears um, and then I decided I'm leaving. And it was such good that before I had things, before I left the building, I was going to have lessons. I had to go and tell the secretary, the head teacher secretary that I'm leaving because, you know, they'd had to get a cover teacher. But she wasn't in her room and I was crying in the corridor and the head teacher came out and she was a really lovely woman. And she said, what's happened? And she said, come in my room, tell me what's happened. And then I told her, and then I told her everything, how he's made my life hell. Um, he's a nasty man. I didn't tell her about the touching of students because I'd forgot. I thought, I, you need proof to, to give that allegation. And then she said to me, okay, I'm going to take care of it. And she then said, she said, you go home. And she said, I'm going to deal with him. And Alhamdulillah, then I went and she dealt with him. Um, and he was he must have been given a really stern warning. And they said to me, take your time before you come back. And then he said, they said, you never have to be in a meet be on your own with him. If there's any, any time you have meetings where he's, you know, assessing your work and that, there will be a third person there. And then basically he backed off completely um, because, you know, I think they basically said she could, sue, you know, sue the school for discrimination and harassment. And the thing is, I didn't want any trouble. I just was thinking, I just want to pass my year because I thought that's going to, you know, I'll have to restart my year. It was like the last term. But Alhamdulillah, Allah saved me and um, I passed my year. And I, and and then I went to their teacher and I said, I'm, I'm leaving. <laughs> I put my resignation. I, I thought I need to get out of this mad school uh, with these crazy head of yeah, who and um, and I thought I'm not even going to report the the his behaviour because because you know they could accuse me just because you know I had a problem with him. I'm now accusing him of this. Can you can you see it? And I'm this Asian Muslim hijabi, and there's something wrong with me. Because can you see how? Uh, that prevented me from safeguarding and but I thought this is I don't care I, I'm just leaving and then the head she said to me no why don't you go part-time and then it will be easier for you and and the, I don't know this woman had was words were so persuasive she persuaded me to stay <clears throat> another year but she said you can go part-time and then I thought you know what that doesn't sound like a bad idea. The stress will be less. I won't have to see everyone. Because, um, you know, the atmosphere in the English department, it was so nasty. It was just him backbiting about everyone and his bimbo cronies sitting there saying, yes, yes. And and I, and I never sat with them after that. I used to go and sit in the room to do my marking on my own. And I knew they were saying stuff about me. But I thought, 
I don't want to spend any time with you. Um, you know, you have nothing. Being with you makes me feel like an awful mess. You know, I have to listen to you guys just tell, saying how great you are. And they used to backbite about the head teacher. Like every t- other teacher was um, hot, useless apart from them. And they were amazing. But that's the way it is in staff rooms. Teach- staffing, staff rooms, they, they slag off the other teachers. They slag off kids. It's It's really... Um, I was really sick and tired of that but okay I went back part-time and again and then by the end of that I just thought I've had enough this this is and you know like I used to go and pray I'd have to lock my classroom pull the curtain down and pray and um, you know I was once in the a book room and a kid and I'm praying in there because and the kid like chucked the ball in didn't know I was there praying I said oh sorry miss <laughs> and I just thought you know what um, the other thing I started thinking about was my children that I'm not spending enough time with them and that's I really did think and this is a lesson I like to share with you that I started to think you know what Ella didn't tell me I have to work Ella didn't make me have to put up with this stress you know Alhamdulillah my husband was working and then I'm not a, I used to like have to cook in the eat you know weekends like for the rest of the week the cleaning was stressful. I was so silly. I should have got a cleaner. Um, but my, I wasn't taking my priorities from Islam. That the priorities that Allah had given me. That you know, in Islam, gaining um, Islamic knowledge is an obligation. Working full time is not an obligation. Let's be clear. You know, don't mince out for a woman. Yeah. Um, now, from that straight away, someone's going to say, "Well, what if you're a single mom and you have to work?" Yeah. Everyone's circumstances are different. I understand. So if you have to work, you have to work. No, I'm not saying that, but as the general rule is if, you, if, you, if you're married and your husband's providing, then the woman, you don't have to work. But I was ignoring that. Uh, and I was, I was neglecting gaining a snap knowledge. You know, I think I was, neg- you know, I wasn't always there for my children to have these ridiculous waste of time staff meetings that I'd come home a bit late you know spending time marking so it's taking me away from my fam spending time with my husband time away from my children you know I'm coming home stressed like you've given your energy to the school and to strangers children and you come home tired and exhausted and you don't want to spend time with your own family that's not how Allah tells us to prioritize our time and so I started to question that so um but one thing I did do, I thought, I'm going to report this guy before I leave. And I had to do it really secretly to begin with. I met this one English lady who, um, she was on the governing board. She came to talk about something. And then I pretended I wanted to talk to her about something, about universities or whatever. And everyone left because when I said to her, oh, I'm in the English department and... I got the impression she didn't like that head of yeah head of English, so I stayed behind. And then I thought, okay, I'm just going to tell her everything I'm observing, because I thought I'm going to leave anyway, and I wanted her to know. I thought I can't live with myself as a Muslim if I don't say something. And then she said to me that you know what I have heard these rumors as well. Can you believe it? And then she said, will you put something in writing? I said, yes, I will, because I'm leaving. And she said, I'm going to raise this at the governor's meeting, the head of governors. And then I thought, I'm going to leave it with her. You know, on the day of judgment, I can say I did something. Nothing happened. I then left that school. Didn't say, I, I left, I took two weeks of sick leave prior to leaving because I was um, I was unwell and I didn't say goodbye to any of the teach English department. I didn't want to see anyone or, uh, and I didn't want any flowers. I didn't want this fake. I didn't want any of it. So I left two weeks early with sickness leave. And then even afterwards, it really played on my mind that nothing's happened to this guy who is basically like borderline paedophile in my eyes. Um, so I wrote a letter to the head of the governors outlining everything. Guess what? Nothing happened. I wrote to Luton Council. Nothing happened. Still, and then he took retirement and that's it. And I know why that happened is because there's a shortage of teachers and he was a good English, head of English. And when he left, he put one of his bimbo cronies as the, he gave her the job. So can you see how when like that, it's such a mess 
why would I want to be on working or go back to these schools that are just the rules are there but they don't follow them it's just and and the thing is shall I tell you I hear you know you get Muslim teacher um, you know that's you know some Muslims can work in schools and it's fine it works great I know Muslim teachers who do that and so I'm not saying don't work in schools Muslims shouldn't work blah 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 but um, I can see why Muslims leave work environments like that but for me, more importantly, I had put work above my family. And what a horrible work I had put in front. You know, I got my qualification. I learned some really good skills and that was good. But why did I Why did I do that? Because, you know, I did think if I'm going to be at home, I'm going to be bored and be lonely. But also I was doing it for the money. And the thing is, that idea, you know, that, that very basic idea that our risk is fixed, I had lost sight of that that Allah will provide. So why am I neglecting the duties that Allah had given me over money? And that's something I'd really like you to think about, that are you doing that? Are you neglecting any, gaining knowledge? Are you neglecting your husband or your children? I'm not saying you are, I'm just saying, ask yourself this question. Am I even neglecting my parents for the sake of work? Am I neglecting even the chance to find a spouse? Have I prioritised work above looking for a spouse because society has given you this ridiculous idea that work is more important and making money is more important than having a family so you know that this there's more to tell about another school that I worked in but I'm going to um I'm going to finish it there because I think I've said quite a lot but can you see how you know alhamdulillah work life balance is not easy but I've come to, I now um, tutor online because I love teaching kids who want to learn. Um, I then, you know, there's books, the online books that I've written. And so I do earn money through them, alhamdulillah. I then, so the books I've written are Smart Single Muslimer, Hands Off Our Hijab and um, child, uh, child Loss from an Islamic Perspective. So their book, so I've found ways to earn money whilst keeping hold of the passion, which is Islam. Uh, I also have um, a website called Farhat Amin, which I sell Islamic stickers and Eid and Ramadan decorations. So can you see, once I had left teaching, I then the other avenues, I could explore other avenues. And you know this idea, if you're in a rubbish job, just leave. Yeah, like make some plans and then leave. Allah will provide for you. Don't stay in a bad job that is stressing you out and is making you neglect your Islam or making you feel you have to compromise your Islam. Because whilst working in schools, that compromise did happen. Yeah, and I now that I'm out of that environment, I'm just such a um, a happier Muslim. I, I can think if I pass away, I can say to Allah, I didn't, I did use my time wisely, inshallah. So, you know, inshallah, I, I hope this podcast helped you. Uh, it was it was very different to the other ones that I um, did. But the, um, yeah, the inspo, the, it, it's, that, it's that podcast, the Trojan Horse Affair serial podcast that just opened up such a can of worms in my mind. I had to just discuss this. Uh, so, yes, I hope you found it useful. And inshallah, if you, you know, subscribe to the podcast, inshallah, for, I'm probably going to talk about this again because there's more to tell. Um, oh, I forgot to say to you, you know that Islamic school that, you know, I worked for now, alhamdulillah, it's flourishing. Alhamdulillah, it's gone bigger. And I think, alhamdulillah, Allah's put people in charge of that. Some of the people who, they're, they're still in charge and they're doing a really good job. It shows that, you know, that decision to, for me and my friend to have left it was a good decision because it's meant that school has grown bigger and better and maybe that would never have happened. It wouldn't have happened if me and my friend had still been there. So Alhamdulillah, you know, and um, yeah, so and, and I don't, I've forgiven, by the way, I don't mind, does it sound like I forgave them? I hope it does, but I have genuinely forgiven all the Muslims that caused that trouble for me that I had um 
Yeah, I really have. And I wish them, I from the bottom of my heart, I wish them all the best. And they are doing a really good job. Alhamdulillah. But yeah, so I was saying, so please leave a review for this podcast if you enjoyed it. Um, you can visit my website, Smart Single Muslima, to see my books and courses. And inshallah, I will speak to you again soon. Let's remember each other in our duas. <laughs>